the work that I do never gets done by me. Um, I feel like sometimes I'm interpreting from one person to another, but that's the best that I can do. However, I'm in this interesting position where there are two different projectors, and I forget the one day, we'll start with this one. So being at all the months is really a huge pleasure. This was all Roddick's doing, and so I'm, I'm grateful for that tremendously. The work I'm going to talk about was done mostly by these four people. They were students and postdocs, and they're diffused now. She's a professor in Copenhagen. He's a professor in Copenhagen. He's a professor in Wisconsin. And he is advising my government in Washington. Um, I hope they listen, but I'm not sure they will. And then there are senior colleagues. I mean, when you get old enough, you can't really do anything yourself anymore, so you have to find people to help you out. Um, my colleague, Mike Wasluski, is, is an organic chemist, but he does amazing things with molecules, and I'll talk a little bit about his work. Juan Bart Chen is the chair of chemistry at the University of Hong Kong. Um, he's a very smart fellow. First thing he did when he became chair was to rent another room to which he can actually do his science. <laughs> So he, he has a lot of science that is fighting for the chair. Vladimir Mojica is from Venezuela, but he worked with me for a long time in Chicago and is now in Arizona in the States. Lots of sun. And Adrian Sun is, I think, the best theoretical chemist in the world. I've known him for 15 years. We've written 60 papers together. And it's been just a tremendous joy to work with him. If you ever get the opportunity, listen to his talks, read his book. It's a big book. Read his book. He's an amazing person. And as I understand it, this is the Tujaratnik lecture. He is a person that I've admired for 40 years. And I've met him from time to time. Um, he really began sophisticated computational chemistry in the Czech Republic. And he's a wonderful person. So I am duly honored to be a Tujaratnik lecturer. So let's talk just a bit about nano, because there's an awful lot of nano going on. So if you look on the web of science and you look for citations for nano, you know it sort of goes up. It goes up quite rapidly. This is 2011. Of course, it would be much, much bigger today. Um, and my university is, is a private university, which is to say we don't get any money from the federal government. We have to go up and raise it. And most of we raise it by charging students an impossibly large amount of money to take classes in my place. I mean, impossibly large amount. $40,000 a year to be an undergraduate, and that's before you get coffee or orange juice or anything like that, or any place to sleep. So in order to do that, you have to always be chasing money, and you chase money from people who have graduated. So we make a magazine. So this magazine comes out every month, and this was the cover of the magazine in 2002. And it said, small is big, the amazing world of nanotechnology. And what you see here actually are dark-scale images of a series of quantum dots put together. And you can see the, the colors are different because the sizes of the quantum dots are different, and they go on and off. It's a nice cover. But now it's supposed to get into the nano game fairly early, actually. And in fact, we built an early nano building. We, we did something smart. We found the American equivalent of Roddick, and we hired him. And we built this building, we gave him an office. So that's him, Chad Merkin, and that's his office. And that office was way too small, and so we built him a real building. Just that one. And that's his office, and that's my office. And that's a building that is involved in making nanostructures. His major stuff is in biology, so mostly biological studies. But the building is, is a nano building. It was the first one in the States that called itself a nano building. Nano, of course, is very small. This is not a small building. That's the way it always is. OK, I want to talk about something that relates to a great Czech specialty. The great Czech specialty is electrochemistry. Hayrovsky, obviously, was one of the heroes of electrochemistry. But electrochemistry, in general, was very well developed in the Czech Republic at all of the institutions. But I want to talk about something that's almost not quite the same. So let's start with Emily Weiss's work. This is one of my students and is now one of my colleagues, and she's great. She made this molecule, these molecules, because you change the number of, of bridging benzene groups. 
And this is a donor acceptor compound. You're quite excited at this end. There's an expectation travel there or the you can throw it around. This is a pair of lean dianid, which are interesting for other reasons having to do with photovoltaics. But the question she wanted to know was, how does the electron go from the excited state here over to there? And this is the donor bridge acceptor entity. The acceptor is the same. The bridge is different. The donor is the same. And you can do photo excited electron transfer and measure things on picoseconds or nanosecond time scales. And you can explain them using the twin parabolas that Rudy Marcus invented back in the 1950s. So you have a reactant, you have a product, and there's a tunneling matrix element that allows you to tunnel from the reactant to the product. And you have this V, which is this tunneling integral. And then you can just do the rule and the rule. You can ignore all the really complicated stuff and say, OK, I'm going to go from the reactant to the product. How am I going to do that? I'm going to tunnel across right there. And then I have to get rid of this energy, because this, this, this has more energy than that. And that delta E has to go someplace. There has to be a sink for the energy. And what Marcus realized was that the best sink is the polarization of the environment. So it could go into the molecular vibrations, or it could go into the vibrations of the solid. And he came up with expressions for both of those, which were improved by Joshua Jordner, um, basically to, to take the complete quantum mechanical case into account. But this is basically the rate concept. So this is Marcus's relationship. The rate concept is this constant times the tunneling squared, the square of the amplitudes we're going from there to there, times the density of states weighted from a constant factor. And all that tells you is how I get rid of the energy. I have to get rid of the energy, and that tells you how. So not only was this worth the Nobel Prize to Rudy Marcus, it really allowed us to understand electron transfer reactions like the one I showed you. But now we have another kind of electron. And this one could only happen after the invention of scanning tunneling microscopes. So here we have, for example, two gold entities. One could be an electrode on a surface, or it could be a surface. The other one could be a tip that you bring down. And then you put a molecule between these. Now, now this is a sketch. We don't really know how many molecules there are, and we don't really know what they look like. But this is a sketch because we know we started with that molecule. So this is some work in, in Heiko Weber's group. Lots of people have done this. I just like the simplicity of the slide. How does current flow through a single molecule? This is bulk gold. This is bulk gold. This is one molecule, one. So you put one molecule between two massive electrodes, and you ask, as I change the voltage, how does the current go? Is there a Ohm's law? You need a theory. For single molecule rate junctions, and that's what these are called, you need here. Here's the experiment that's done at four degrees. Um, the current is in red, and you see that it's slightly asymmetric around zero. The conductance, which is the derivative of the current with respect to potential, looks like this. There's this big hole in the middle, and then you see that it's not the same on both sides. Since it's not the same on both sides, you sort of think it should be this molecule, and that's right. This one is for that molecule. But the question is, why does it look like this? Oh, I should say why there are so many lines. Because it's characteristic of single molecule spectroscopy. You do the experiment, and you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And what the lines are are simply different attempts right after one another. Now, this is my former colleague, John Popel. Um, John was a great scientist, truly great scientist. And he was the person who really brought electron instruction methodology for chemistry to a proper position. And he went to Stockholm for doing that, and, and his office was next to mine for 15 years. And I tried to interest him in this topic, and he said to me, if you can find me 15 good experimental data that have been reproduced in more than one laboratory, I won't to work with you. And I couldn't. So we worked on other things. But John, John came up with this idea of a model chemistry. And a model chemistry, he said, was something where you've used the methodology of theory at a particular level to predict behaviors. And how do you know you're right? Well, you know you're right by taking a test set of molecules where people have measured the ionization energy, or the electron affinity, or the optical spectrum, or the total energy, or the redox potential. Any good data, good to John was within one kilocalorie. For mold, it's, it's better now. But that was his limit. And you can make a model chemistry. And when you did that, 
If you then did a calculation, like the 631G star and an NP2 level, and if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. One of them tells you what kind of description you're giving of the material, and the other one tells how the electrons move around. You could predict. And so right now, today, if you wanted to make oligosilane, short polysilicon, it's much better to calculate the energies with the measurements. The measurements are difficult to make. The molecules can be unstable. The calculations are right. Why are they right? Because they've been normed against this, this set of data. So that was John's idea. And, and you know, this is exactly how it works. Um, you, you can improve the way you're describing how the electrons know about each other. This is correlation started with Harvey Bach from full configuration interaction. Basically, in your calculation, you have to figure out how the electrons bind each other. And that's what this is. It tells you better and better and better how to find it. This tells you where there are a lot to go. It's the basic set. I should say that this problem has been incorrectly done in transport by everybody in the world so far, including me, but including everybody else who's done it. And afterwards, we can talk about that. Um, but for single isolated molecules, this works beautifully. You can imagine you have an infinite basis and you're doing all the correlations that you have. And that's the exact solution to the Schrodinger question. The exact solution. So, so the electronic structure became a problem that you could define the right answer for, which is really quite wonderful. OK, now for, for a model chemistry, the kind that John liked, these are the assumptions that you can make. You don't have to be hot, so you can ignore the temperature. You don't need relativity, so you can let the rate constant of the constant speed like it to infinity. The density is zero. One molecule in the universe. You're only calculating one molecule at a time. No worry about vibronic effects. And then finally, and the most important thing is this. There are two electrons in H2. There are two electrons in helium. There are 10 electrons in water. And that's an integer. It's not you know, 2.003. It's two. Now, if you want to do transport, though, this whole model chemistry has to be extended because, if you remember the little scheme, the molecule in the middle is talking to huge reservoirs of electrons on the right and on the left. And it's very improbable that it's going to maintain two electrons if it's, say, H2. So in fact, what you see is that you can no longer assume the temperature is zero because the measurements are made at finite temperature. You can ignore relativity. That's OK. The density isn't zero anymore. You can't do it with one single isolated molecule. You need to cut off by the electron. That's not true anymore either. There are vibronic effects. And if there were three lectures instead of one, we could talk about that because it's very interesting. But you can't assume that that's true. The most important thing is you can't assume that there's the number of electrons that you know. Think about that sketch. That molecule in the middle probably started with you know, 164 electrons. But there are electrons flowing in and out on both sides. So depending on the voltage, the number of electrons on the molecule is different. And it's not an integer. So the model chemistry that Popol and all of the quantum chemical community has developed over the last 60 years, including Rolf Schleidman, doesn't work here. We have to expand it. Now this is typical of single molecule spectroscopy. A bulk, that's a rubber band. You can certainly write all equations for the elasticity of a rubber band we've all played with. The measurements are averages over a whole ensemble of molecules. We know that the rubber band is made of, of alkanes, basically. And they're moving all the time. But you don't worry about their moving all the time. That's just heat, actually. So the fluctuations are negligible. Fluctuations normally scale like one of the square root of a number. If the number is 50 billion, the fluctuations are small. So for bulk measurement, fluctuations don't matter. For single molecule spectroscopy, and these are two cartoons of single molecule spectroscopy, here transport, and here redox chemistry. One molecule. If you make a measurement, you'll probably get the same answer. But really, there are many molecules, or the one molecule is moving around. And every time it moves around, it changes its occupation, it changes its position. So you have to do a new calculation. If you're making measurements, what you see is a distribution. You don't see a single line. You see a distribution. And that's characteristic of single molecule behavior. This is a cartoon that was drawn in France in 1992. There's a battery. There's an ammeter. 
And there are these two alligators. And the alligator is grabbing onto the molecule with something that is sometimes called an alligator clip. Macroscopically, you can buy those in little stores for fuel electronics. Microscopically, you have to construct a bond there between the electrode and the molecule, and that's a difficult thing to do. So this is the problem that we're going to confront. And here are some answers to that problem. This is a beautiful work from, from a group in London and then scattered throughout the UK. What, what they've done here, this is the current as a function of distance. So what they do is they take a tip and put it up above the mo a molecule on the surface, and then they wait. And the molecule is bouncing around and stuff like that. Eventually, psh, up it goes. And then it has a complete circuit. When you get a complete circuit, you can see that measurement. So that's what you see here. These are the individual measurements of the current versus this distance parameter. And then they can make a cup. This is a histogram. You can see that A1, A2 both look like sort of, well, they're not Gaussian, actually, but they're distributed. There's a maximum and then falls off in both directions. Right? Variable contact gap. That's what you see. You don't see one number, you see a distribution. Why? Well, this is some. A very unsophisticated calculation from a very sophisticated group in Copenhagen. What they've done is to take that little atom and move it from there to there to there, and then all the way to the break. And you can see that the conductance changes by roughly a factor of 10. And that's what you'd expect. This geometric fluctuation gives you roughly a factor of 10. So if you made your measurement and the molecule's moving, you'd have to get some of this and some of that and some of that and some of that, and that average gives you this, this figure. Now, what's the theory? How do you explain this? Mr. Landauer, Austrian neighbor, but he moved to IBM when he was pretty young, and he did almost all of his work at IBM, and this is his result. Now, he didn't know about molecules. He was doing semiconductors. This was invented for semiconducting gas, and IBM was very interested in semiconducting. Now, the conductance is the atomic unit of conductance. That's the constant of nature. That's constant of nature. This is a constant of nature times the sum over all these transition probabilities. And what he thought was, imagine I were standing here with 50 tennis balls, and there were an open window there. And I was throwing the tennis balls at the window, and sometimes they would make it through, and sometimes they wouldn't. So whether or not they make it through is this transmission probability, the probability that it goes through. And this is the sum over all the different windows I can try to get this ball through. Right? And this is the conductance quantum. So his picture is the conductance of scattering. Electrons come at this barrier. If they make it through, the, tra the transmission probability is 1. If they get backscattered, the transmission probability is 0. You sum this over all the possible windows, and that will give you the conductance Q. Now, this is very interesting because Normally, we think that some integers of nature, for example, the charge of the electron or the charge of the proton or something like that, they're constants of the nature. And, and you know, Planck's constant, mass of the electron, those sorts of things. This is a new constant of nature, and it's e squared over h. And when Landauer proposed this, there were no measurements. There were no measurements of this kind either. But now we think we have a model, because Landauer was analyzing the situation to go from continuum to discrete to continuum. So maybe we're getting there. The important thing is where the energy dissipates. In Marcus' theory, the energy dissipates in polarization, which is to say it goes to the solvent and it goes to the solvent coordinate. Here there is no solvent, so it can't do that. What it can do is deposit its energy in the gold cluster, and that is the primary factor. So there's a difference between these measurements of transport and electron transfer theory. Now, there's one similarity. The electrons have to tunnel. The electron has to tunnel somehow from here to here and all the way through that. Here, the electron has to tunnel from the to the acceptor. So electron tunneling occurs in both of them. But everything else is different. And in particular, the measurements are different. Here, you measure a conductance. Here, you measure a rate constant. Now, because both of them depend on electron tunneling. They should be proportional. That was an idea that they came up with in 2002, and it's correct, of course. Now, all of this other stuff is different. Here, your sink is the electrodes. There is the vibrations and polarization. 
Here you have an electrode interface, there you have the donor receptor bridge structure. Here you have this Landauer approach, and there you have the Marcus formula. But we're beginning to understand at least a little bit now about how you can describe theoretically what people are making measurements of. And that's not all we're talking about. So this is the 21st century in which you don't do science really, you do science by designing PowerPoints. And then you get nicer PowerPoints from your friends, and so things are, things are good. So these are PowerPoint science. This one is from my lab. This one is from the lab at Columbia that I'll talk about later. This one is from the cover of Scientific American. That's Mark Reed's first measurement through benzene diphthyl. And this is real science. This one comes from Switzerland. And this is a scanning probe image. Actually, it's the transmission spectroscopy. That's the break junction. That's where the molecule is. It's right there between two tips of metal. But if you look at the space bar, and you remember that the average molecule is a couple of angstroms in size, you can't see it. Is it there? Well, maybe it's there. Or maybe it's not. Or maybe there are two of them there, or three of them there. How do you know? You don't. You can sketch it like that and that and that, but you don't know. How do you know when you measure the transport through there? And if you measure the transport and see signatures of the molecule, then you figure out the molecule is there. Now let's start back with this business of quantized transport. If it's just gold, gold cathode, gold anode, gold electron pathway like this one, then you can make measurements and you would suspect that you should see that Landauer conductance. This is a Spanish specialty, and Nicolas Wright is one of the experts in this, and this is, this is in fact what he sees. So you take a gold tip on your STM and just go up and down over the gold surface like this, and you measure the conductance. And what you see is just what Landauer suggested. Three quantum conductance, one, two, one, three, two, one. These are repetitive measurements. Each time you do this, you make one of these observations, and then you can make histograms to bin that. And you can see that the conductance comes in quanta. One quantum, two quanta, three quanta. The reason they're spread out like that is the geometries. But you can see that the quantization of charge is really correct. So a very similar idea was developed by two different groups, actually. One is a man named Benjamin Tao, and this is electrochemistry. It's modern electrochemistry. What you do is you have this conducting tip, which is gold. You have a solution in which there are molecules, and you have a counter electrode, and that's gold. And you take this thing up and down, because it's going up and down on this, on this STM plate. And it can go down and get through the molecules, but usually when it starts coming back up, it can catch a molecule between that tip and that tip. You see this molecule is tied, and that's transport that you see through the molecule. Now, because you're doing this several thousand times in an hour, you get a lot of data. And you plot the data. Yeah, and this is what you get. Now, this is with the gold wire, so-called gold point contact. You can see the conductance is again quantized, again distributed, but quantized, one, two, and three units. This is benzene diphyl, and these are the early, early measurements, 2004 of Tau. You can see that there's a, there's a sort of cluster around that one, or a cluster around that one, or a cluster around that one. And, and these are 100 times smaller than that. This is 100 times less conductive than another metal metal. But you can see that there is transport, and it does indeed come in magnitudes that are multiplied by some integers. And that's Tau. OK, I'm a theorist. I play with the equations. And the transport formula that Landauer gave is correct, but not computable. You don't know how to actually compute those things. So instead, you try it out all in John Popel's armamentarium. You bring in all of quantum chemistry. And in order to do that, you need a formulation. This is the formulation. The conductance is a quantum of conductance, which we'll talk about before, times a Fermi factor that tells you you have to start from a full level there and go to an empty level there times this transmits. This thing is called the transmits, this product of four vectors. This one tells about the broadening of the interface. That one tells about the broadening of that interface. And the Gs are propagators, and they propagate charge from one end to the other. And if you can calculate this, then you have the answer. These are different people who develop this stuff. This is easy to read. This is hard to read. This is extremely hard to read, and this is harder. 
And that one's very nice. So if you want to do this stuff, send me an email and I'll send you an address. Because there's a place at one of the universities in the States that has tutorials on this from the people who invented it. And it's got lectures and it's got exams and you can take courses. You don't have to move out of your bed to learn all of it. Um, and that was also Briodata's work. But he was the person who actually made this calculable using ordinary methods. This is a cartoon that my former postdoc, Alessandro Trujisi, drew. He's now in Warwick in England doing wonderful stuff. But this is the model. First thing you have to do is figure out that the molecule sits between two electrodes. What's the geometry? You don't know. Well, what would you do when you do the variation principle? You quantum chemistry. Yet the geometry can't do that. Why can't you do that? Because the thing's under voltage. It's not at equilibrium. Non-equilibrium, the variational principle doesn't hold. So what you do is assume that the variational principle is OK. And then you calculate the geometry. So that's the first thing you have to do. You can calculate the geometry, and then you can get the strength of the interaction between the molecule and the electrode. That's pretty straightforward. It's just perturbation theory. And then you need the density of states, the local density of states. That's what physicists will always tell you is going to win. Right? You have to take this electron and put it someplace. Well, the more places there are to put it, the more probable you can get it there. And that's the density of states, which you can also calculate. So these are relatively easily calculated once you assume a geometry here. Then you have to do that whole gamma g, gamma g thing. And normally that starts looking like quantum chemistry and density functional theory calculations with an atomic basis set of the kind that go on in the Hall's lab all the time. Um, lots of people have formulated ways to do this. Imaginary band structure, um, cutting off certain parts of the tail, fantastic quantum chemistry, and an attempt to do it in MP2, which didn't work, but that's going to be interesting in the future. These are some calculations that David Adams did when he was working with me. And, and this is just molecular dynamics. You have a molecule between two electrodes, and you run molecular dynamics, and the molecule advances. Looks all these different geometries. And you sum over all those different geometries, and this is what your transmittance looks like. You can see that it looks basically the same. And all these fluctuations are there. And all those fluctuations are because the molecule is changing its geometry slightly. Not huge fluctuations, but some fluctuations. You can bin those, and that's what's done down there. They look like skewed Gaussians, and there's a good reason for the skew. OK. And this has nothing to do with what I've been talking about. This is optical spectroscopy of DNA. But what I want to show you for is that it fluctuates just like it should. You start with your, your you know, sort of time here. And then it goes red, green, red, green, red. And then it splits. Small green, small red, and it comes together again. What's happening is the molecule is changing its geometry. As it changes its geometry, its optical spectrum changes, and it blinks back and forth. That's an OK measurement. The better measurement is this one. This has to do with a completely different phenomenon. It's ion transport. It's basically what's keeping you at non-equilibrium. And if all the ion transport in your body stopped working, you would be dead in three seconds. But you have lots of it. It's going on everywhere. That's how things get in and out of cells. They go through channels. And if you make measurements of transport through a single channel, this is Grandma Seidman, but we've got lots of them, it flickers. It's high, and then it's low, and then it's high, and then it's low. You don't know how often it's going to do that. You don't know how broad those are, how narrow those are. But that's what your body is doing right now. It's not Ohm's law. It's not linear. It's fluctuating. Why is it fluctuating? Because the, the channels are individual. It's single channels going into and out of cells. That's the same thing. Let's get this. And we'll go back to 2007. 2007, I went on a trip, not quite to as nice a place as Old Woods, but I was gone for about a week and a half. When I came back, there was a paper on my desk. And it was written by these people. And Jen is now a professor in Copenhagen, David we'll be talking about. Thorsten is also a professor in Copenhagen, who ended up in Wisconsin. And Josh is now at the University of Illinois. And they had gotten together in my absence and discovered something. Something that the organic chemists knew, but I didn't. Once a year, my group goes to my house, and we have a group meeting at the house. Well, this is a group meeting at the house. The snow indicates that this is July in Chicago. And these are the people who were involved with writing that paper. This transport business really began with my first student, whose name was Ari Agaron, and still is. And, and 
He was a wonderful person. He walked into my office one day and said, I want you to be my PhD advisor. I know what the topic is. I know how I'm going to do it. I'm going to support myself so you don't have to pay me. I'm going to get you some lectures at IBM, and I'll pay you. And um, that's what we're going to do. I said, yes, that's what we're going to do. So he came up with this idea of molecular transport. That was 1974. And then when, when people began to think about it from a single molecule point of view, there were lots of mention of lots of synthesis. These crazy starter type molecules there and there, these, these trefoil molecules that Jim Tour made, these long oligomers that Jim Tour made. Randy Goldsmith, my student, got into the laboratory and actually made propellane structures. Um, Elving made these guys to see about stereochemistry at that linkage. These are some measurements of Stuart Lindsay on carotene. All of these beautiful molecules can be explained using a theory that goes back 1963 by a guy named Simmons. And it was transport theory. It was basically a tunneling. He said, OK, if I have an electrode on the left, electrode on the right, I'm going to tunnel through this thing. And the only things you need to know are the geometry of the tunneling, how high the barrier is, how thick it is, and what its shape looks like. And if you just do that really simple model, it explains a lot of things very, very well. For instance, some experiments by Ackerman where he had this PSS layer. And this is the transport. These are the data and the curves are the curves that come from Sims model. It's perfect. Perfect. So everything is reduced to barrier tunneling, just like the second or third class in quantum mechanics, electrons tunneling through a barrier. And then there are these rules of thumb. So these are some measurements on, on DNA that were made by Tau. And basically, it shows that the, ex the transport dries off exponentially depending on how many APs you put between the GC pairs. Exponential tunneling. It's, again, very common. And we know as chemists that you expect this conjugated molecule, the carotenoid, to be transporting electrons much, much greater than these saturated alkanes. And in fact, that's true also. These are saturated ones, saturated ones, saturated ones. And then there's this homo lumo stuff. So it's just an existential problem. So in a country that Franz Kafka came from, it's a good time to think about these molecules. Because this, I think, doesn't exist. I don't think there is such a thing as a lumo. Joseph Nickel and I have been arguing about this for 20 years. So if you want to join the fight, let me know. As long as you come in on the right side, it's fine. But here's what's different. Now suppose we go back to my equation. I'm going to tell you how to tra do transport in the simplest possible chemical system, which is a Hubble Hamiltonian for ethylene. So in the Hubble Hamiltonian for ethylene, there are two sites. They have both energy alpha. They're tunneling matrix element beta between the two. We know that you can make bonding and antibonding orbitals, that they have a node in the middle when they're antibonding. If beta is negative, and therefore the lower energy one is the bonding orbital, and the higher energy one is the non-bonding orbital. And this is the solution to the molecule we're making. Now, we have to worry about the fact that the molecule talks to the electrode. So this site, site 1, talks to the electrode there. And this site, site 2, talks to the electron there. And so the coupling element between the molecule and the electrodes has this element here, and it has that element there. And this, this is really simple. I've got matrices. I can calculate this matrix product. That will give me the transmittance, the transmission. And if I do that, and the machine just stopped, Probably hit it with my fingers. <laughs> Battery. <laughs> now does it work? Yes. It's like science fiction, very most. <laughs> anyway, so this is what they look like. So let's see what happens. We have to take this matrix product, remember? We need a product from the T matrix and the G matrix, but those are the gammas. We know those. And the G we can calculate. So here's what the equations look like. This is the transport as a function of energy. You can see that in the middle of the gap, it doesn't transport very well. And there it's going through the homo, and there it's going through the lumo. Since lumo doesn't exist, we'll just say there it's going through a level that's bound, and your level is unbound. But we can change that. We have to integrate this over the Fermi gap. 
So let's do that. And you can see that as you integrate from, from farther on one end, farther on the other, you get a curve which describes that. And so if you look at, at the current, or look at just the current, start at zero, goes up, and eventually reaches the maximum because there's no more stock that it can get on your side. This is what the theory would predict. Okay, now let's do something funny. We can look at what the theory predicts, and here's the calculation. What you can see is that as you change the values of alpha and alpha prime, which are basically the identity ones, you can see that you've got this two peak spectrum. Two peaks, the antibonding and the bonding peak, and they move a little bit. That's fine. Now we're going to change something. But the something we're going to change does not involve anything on changing the molecule. We're just going to tie it up differently. Instead of tying up the molecule linearly, we'll tie up the molecule in a T shape. Now, does the Hamiltonian of the molecule change between there and there? This is a yes or no question. Does it change or doesn't it change? There's a poem about an American game called baseball. And one of the lines in this poem is, and upon that stricken multitude a death-like silence sat. Okay. Is this molecule the same if I keep it in this direction or if I turn it that way? Or is it if I have a molecule that way and that way, is it the same molecule? Yes, it's the same molecule. So don't change the molecule. What we've changed is the environment. We've changed the G. We've changed how the molecule talks to that side of the world. Here it talks to that world and that world. Here it talks to that one and that one, but through the same site. Now those molecules are exactly the same, but their transmissions are completely different. And you can see what happens. This is the transmission through this guy. And it looks a little bit like that, but right in the middle it has this gigantic hole. And it is gigantic, it's seven orders of magnitude, so it's 10 million times less conductive. Why is that? Why is it that this molecule, exactly the same molecule, has different geometries, giving tremendously different something like this? Well, it's interference, and it's stuff that you should have known from organic chemistry. Back in 1968, Orkin wrote this review article in which he distinguishes between this molecule and that molecule. And this one has pi system, pi system, pi system, conjugate, perfectly conjugate, just like benzene. This one has pi system, pi system, but this one is conjugated to that, this one's conjugated to that, but these are not conjugated to each other. There are two sigma bonds in between these, whereas there's only one sigma bond in between those and one sigma bond between those, and this kind of thing is called a cross-conjugated molecule. Now, of course, Joseph Nickel knew about this when I told him about it, but it took us a long time to learn about it. That's what's going on, and what you're really seeing is phase interference. Now, how do you know you're seeing phase interference? Well, what you can do is make a planar model, and the planar model is, is this one, it's just a fairly simple entity, and you can see that here, with this molecule, the total conductance, which is the black guy, as a function of the energy, the potential, is much smaller in the sigma system than it is in the pi system. And in fact, here and here, the pi system is completely dominating the transport, right in the middle, right at zero volt. What happens is that you lose the pi system altogether. It falls off, goes to nothing. The only thing left is the sigma system. So this black line, which is the sum, is the sum of this one and that one. And it's mostly pi here and here, but it's mostly sigma, right at the middle. That doesn't happen with either the cis or the trans ordinarily conjugated molecule, where triple bond, single, triple, single, or sorry, triple bond, dot, double bond, dot, triple bond. Same thing there. Not there, because now you have this cross conjugated. So that's the, that's the picture, but in fact, the conduction differs by about a factor of 100. And if you make more of them, you make more stuff. So if you have, say, for instance, this long one, you have one, two, three, four cross conjugation, or one, two, three, four CH2s, you can see that the current falls off from this one, which is that, down to this one. Eventually, at high voltages, it gets back. But at low voltages, it doesn't. Now, this is all science fiction. Let's talk about some real science. This is measurement science. This was done in Michael Wasilewski's lab. That nickel is not the nickel that you know. Nickel that you know. 
It's actually his nephew who spent a couple of months in our cluster making molecules in my flat. And you can see that these molecules are different. And this is how, how long it takes to move the electrons. So the smaller this is, the faster. This is the, the standard doubly conjugated, perfectly conjugated entity like that. That takes about 14 picoseconds. These two, this one is saturated right there, and that one's cross conjugated. And they are both about 40 times slower than that one. So this is an interference phenomenon. It's something you learn about in freshman physics, but normally in chemistry you forget about it. This is really important. Interference phenomena happen all the time in organic molecules. We should be thinking about them. So for example, this was a paper that I actually read for reading back in 2003. These were beautiful measurements of molecules made by Marcel Mayor in Switzerland. And, and, and you see here the same sort of thing we saw before, lots of fluctuations on a general pathway. This is current voltage, and this is current voltage. This is for this one, and that is for this one. Now, they really look alike. And if you were a physicist, not a chemist, you would say, oh, there's no difference between these. You know, little boxes are the same everywhere. But if you're a chemist, you would think, gee, that's a metal linkage. And that's a metal linkage. That's a paralinkage. That's a paralinkage. Physical organic chemistry tells me this is going to conduct much, much better than that. In fact, it is, because the units are different. This one is microamps, and that one is nanoamps. In fact, the difference is about a factor of 100. So this molecule conducts 100 times less well than that molecule. And it all has to do with this phase interference that happens in the pi electron system. So Ben Catarano's lab at Columbia is probably the best lab in the world doing this great junction stuff right now. And they're really good at drawing nice cartoons. So this is a nice cartoon. This is gold. This is the tip. That's the gold cantilever. This is the molecule, which is between these two. And you measure where it is by the light scattering, and you measure current by this IV measurement across it. And you can do a lot of stuff with this. The von der Zahn group that Delft uses other kinds of branch function techniques, like the ones that are being developed in Prague. And you can see here that when you do gold, this is the logarithm of the conductance. That is a function of the distance as you put this thing up and down. And again, you see fluctuations. This is probably 100,000 measurements. And you can see that most of them will tell you that gold conducts with that logarithm 0 main g is g0, the quantum of transport that Landauer talked about in the 1950s, is correct for gold. Now, if you take these molecules, these are things with um, thiopines on the end and the benzene ring in the middle. You can see here the metal linkages. Let's compare this one that one, for example. You can see that that one has a maximum around 10 to minus 3 and a half. This one has a maximum around 10 to minus 4 and a half, getting bigger. So this one is conducting substantially less well than that, and this one, again, is conducting substantially less well than that. So again, we see that this business about cross-conjugation is really important. Here's some measurements from Lava's lab again. In this case, there are different molecules. That's the guy that's fully conjugated. This is the saturated one. This is the metal linkage, twice two metas, two non-conjugated bonds. And you can see that the conduction goes from up here to about 10 to the minus 3, to the down here to around 10 to the minus 5, to down here at close to 10 to the minus 6. So the predictions are correct. The phases matter tremendously. That's what this says. That's what this says. When interference happens, all your rules of thumb don't work anymore. Conjugated molecules may be less conducting than saturated ones. Shorter molecules may be much less conducting than longer ones. And thank the Lord we don't have to worry about the homonymal gap. This was the talk that I was going to give when I was first invited to come to Prague and to Brno and to all those. But something happened in between, just something small, which I think is fun. Everything I talked about has nothing to do with time. Right? It's energy, energy. The reason we do that is the same reason that in the second day of quantum chemistry, you learn that you can go from the Schrodinger time dependent equation to the Schrodinger time independent equation. It's easier. It's always easier to work in energy. But sometimes you learn by working in real time. So this guy, Wang Ha Chen, who is the chair of chemistry in Hong Kong, has some programs of this kind where you can actually build entries and then measure the current, not in energy space, but in time space, how fast it develops. That's him. 
His name means greatest in China. That's a fairly challenging name to have. Your name was Evo Greatest in Czech Republic. It would be a hard life. But he's really quite, quite an excellent scientist, a good guy. So he's going to use, this all looks very complicated, but what it really is is Huckle theory with a simple tunneling matrix at the interface. So this is the simplest possible thing you could do. Just the physicists call it tight binding, the chemists call it Huckle or extended Huckle, that's what he does. He has his own equations of motion. When you see these greater than and less than signs, you're getting into deep water. <coughs> and um, that's part of the problem with the theory here, but he can handle that. So what we did were some simple, 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 simple calculations in time to compare with what I showed you before, which were in energy. So what we did was to say, okay, we have chemical potential, which is a little bit higher there than there. We're going to turn the chemical potential on with this electrode. The electrons are going to flow through, and they're going to get to this benzene ring and decide which way to go. And they're going to come out here and be measured at the downstream electrode. And what happens in steady state is what happens after the first, in this case, seven femtoseconds. And you can see that you get no current when you begin. The current comes to the molecule. It says, well, I can go that way or I can go that way. So it does both. This is the current through one pathway as a function. This is the total current as a function of time, and this one is twice that one. That's okay, there are two rows. You come to a break in the road, and half of you go there, and half of you go there, and you come back. It's easy, they're just two highways. It's simple. There's no interference, there's none. Now let's go to this one, which is the meta linkage. It's much more complicated. It begins at time zero, of course, and it starts rising, and it rises almost as fast as that one does. This gets up to about 300, that gets up to about 600. It goes up to 300, then it collapses. Eventually, it goes almost to zero. Well, why is that? Well, but short times, the current comes in, it sees a short pathway that likes that short pathway. So it does that, and that's the four to five current. The total current is mostly going this way. A little bit is going this way. By the time you reach steady state, it's still going through there, but it's going opposite through there. So it's coming in on one level, but it's going out on the other level, and they cancel, and so you basically get zero to nothing. So this is a time-dependent explanation for what we saw before in energy. But once you have enough time that the phases have been set up, these things simply cancel each other, and you get zero voltage. Now, I mentioned IBM, and I mentioned Landauer. Landauer had a postdoc whose name was Boudicca, who's now a professor in Geneva. He's a very deep and, and thoughtful scientist. And he said, OK, we should be able to dream up an apparatus to test this. His apparatus to test this is something called the, the virtual probe, and here's how it works. The virtual probe, the chemist should think of as a very small bit of metal that's on the end of some finger, and you can put it anywhere you want. And wherever you put it, here we put it at that site in the metal end, wherever you put it, it stops the phase at that point. So the, we know that, that amp current has an amplitude and a phase, it kills the phase, only the amplitude. So this is, this is the way Boudicca thought about things. He didn't think about molecules, but we're going to steal what he thought about it and worth use it with molecules. So here what you see is the calculation again. This is the para, which we saw before, and level value about 500. This is the meta, which we saw before. It comes up rapidly and it falls off to zero. This is the meta with dephasing. This is where we've taken that probe and put it right there shutting off the phase on this guy, allowing this to go through and that to go through. And when you do that, you don't get the, the canceling anymore. And so the thing becomes almost the same as half of the para. Its conductivity goes up by about a factor of 10 or 30, depending on where you are. So it's gone up an awful lot just by turning the phase off. This is more interesting. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take that thing and turn it on and off. And make it there, make it not there, make it there, make it not when it's there, so when it's been turned on at time zero, this current goes up to almost 400 again and falls off. That's the current. This is the so-called coherence. Those of you who are not theorists, just don't listen for the next 10 seconds. This is the sum of the off-diagonal density matrix elements squared. So you can see the coherence gets turned off when the current is on. But when the when the, when the Boudicca probe is turned off, the coherence gets big, but the transport gets small. This is because the coherence is causing, re, re, is 
causing a reduction of the transport. So as you allow the thing to have this, in this case, negative interference, destructive interference, the minute the, the coherence becomes big, the current becomes small. And you can do this on and off, on and off, on and off. This is theoretical, but I think you'll probably do this experimentally also. This is interesting, too, and it shows that the <coughs> temperature won't delay. This molecule is very stable. If you just add heat to it, you would think that would cause relaxation. It just has to be way, way, way too small because molecular <coughs> energy levels are like this. Molecules are not solids, which have levels like that. They have levels that you can discretize. That's what makes molecules unique. That and the fact that every benzene is the same as every other benzene. 